Bloomberg Audio Studios. Podcasts, radio, news. You're listening to the Bloomberg Intelligence Podcast. Catch us live weekdays at 10 a.m. Eastern on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business app. Listen on demand wherever you get your podcasts or watch us live on YouTube. All right, let's go to our good friends out in Omaha, Nebraska. Uh, Berkshire Hathaway, Mr. Warren Buffett, he got all the acolytes together in o- Omaha like he does once a year. And people look forward to this. It's like, you know, their Super Bowl, um, the investors in Berkshire Hathaway. Matthew Palazzolo, I believe he was there. I was there. And he is a senior analyst. He covers the insurance companies for Bloomberg Intelligence. Matthew, um, you went. Tell us, give us a lay of the land. What's it like out there in Omaha when these people get together to to talk to Warren Buffett about his investment philosophy. Yeah, it was it was crazy this year actually. It was packed. Yep. So packed uh, as in like a big arena. Arena, yeah. yeah. It's it's the the CHI uh, Health Center arena there. Yep. They said they expected around 40,000 people this year. Wow. Uh, it was in previous years where I've been there the upper bowl of the arena is kind of empty. Okay. It was every seat in the house was taken this year. <laughs> What was the vibe without Charlie Munger? This is the yeah. first time in many years. I mean, he passed away a few months ago. Um, Warren Buffett wasn't up there alone. He had two deputies with him, mm-hmm. very important deputies, if you follow Berkshire Hathaway. But what was the vibe like? Yeah, it was sad, um, for, for sure. And they, usually they start with this movie, right? And usually yeah. the movie's kind of funny, and yep. it's got a bunch of comedic elements to it. It was it was a whole tribute to, to Charlie, and it was, it was you know, touching. Um, but also, Buffett really talked a lot about passing a lot of things on mm. to Greg Abel and how, you know, maybe the next CEO can do this, that. So it was, you know, just a kind of passing of torch seemed yeah. like moment, too. So not just said because Munger wasn't there, but said because Buffett really seemed to be, you know, yep. moving on. All right. He has got a quote unquote problem. And that he has $189 billion of cash on the balance sheet. Well, do you have that problem too? I don't have that yeah, problem. I mean, problem I, when I, think I, of problems, I do I don't carry think that an is. impressive cash in my pocket. <laughs> That's true. But not 189 large. Um, I mean, Realistically, how did how does he put that in? I mean, I guess with T bills at four or five percent, that's not a terrible thing anymore. What's he saying about that? So, so that took a lot of pressure off of holding cash for them. They made like uh, a billion in investment income before, and it went up to like six billion, uh, you know, just from holding cash. Uh, they talked about their retained earnings. Just just having retained earnings and investing that in treasury bills, you should have earnings growth from the company. Wow. Uh, they really talked about. Uh, it's really tough to move the needle. It didn't seem like anything was happening, you know, in terms yeah. of where to put a lot of money to work. Is this time different in terms of Warren Buffett sitting back and, and looking at businesses out there for Berkshire Hathaway to buy? Have there been dry spells like this in the past? I, yeah. I mean, look, they bought Allegheny a couple of years ago for, for almost $12 billion. So my, um, for my good buddy, Jeff Kirby. Yeah. And it wasn't, um, you know, so that wasn't an insignificant deal. So they did something. They've put about $15 billion to work in Japan as okay. well. So it's not like they're doing nothing. It's just these things don't move the needle that much for them when they have, you know, so much capital to begin with. You know, one of our listeners earlier today, uh, Ping Bean said, Boeing. <laughs> Boy, would yeah, that a, be a great deal in terms of size? It's 110 billion market yeah. cap, and could they use a steadying hand? I'm thinking Goldman Sachs, great financial crisis. I don't know if they want to be in the air. They, they had done a couple of equity investments in the airlines years ago, yep. and kind of gave up on that. They also own Precision Cast Parts, which is a big supplier to these companies. So okay. I don't know if they want to be that far in the the value chain for airlines. If you guys missed what Paul was talking about uh, on Friday, uh, Thomas Black, over, who's over at Bloomberg Opinion, he's got a column out that says, "How crazy would it be if Buffett bought Boeing?" It was among the most read on Friday. <laughs> yeah. Everybody was talking about this story. Okay, so if it, if not Boeing, what are the types of businesses? Um, that you think could be next. I mean, I know you cover property and casualty insurance, so that's certainly like where your mind is. But um, any other C's candies out there? Any other apples out there? We'll talk about Apple more in a second. But if there are, I think the next thing they're going to buy is going to be something like we haven't heard of, right? Or it's going to be, you know, they own uh, Lubrizol, a chemical company, right? And they make, they're like one of the only companies that make these specific chemicals for, uh, for EV engines and things like that, you know? So I think that's what they look for. Um, you know, I just, I don't think Buffett, I don't think he has it in him anymore for the, for the last really? kind of elephant yeah. hunt. I don't know. It could happen. I mean, they, they were interested in a uh, 
data company a while ago. It was kind of like a data broker. They talked about at the meeting being interested in a Canadian company. That was kind of all they said. Mm -hmm. They also have uh, several billion dollars of an undisclosed position, which they've kept confidential mm -hmm. in their last 13 Fs. So uh, there's stuff cooking. It's tough. I, I, I you know... I thought they were going to buy all of Oxy. They, they kind of threw cold water on that. So maybe something in... The energy space was a big thing, actually, at the meeting. Okay. Um, Buffett, in his annual letter, had said, you know, more or less, if we're going to get pinged for these wildfire losses, we might not want to be in this business. Uh, but they kind of counterbalanced that at the meeting, saying a lot of, you know, energy demand is going to be through the roof. There's very few companies in the world with the capital to invest in this. We're one of them. So it was kind of a, a little bit of a good cop, bad cop situation. So, you, so on the Apple thing. Yeah. What? Uh, go ahead. I mean, I was surprised to, well, I don't know. Should I, I, yeah, I was surprised. I mean, Apple seems like something should be a, a core holding now. So how did he kind of phrase it all? So, so Tim Cook was there, and he was uh, you know, up in the crowd. Hmm. Um, like he had like a normal seat? He had, a, he had a front row seat. <laughs> okay, I was just, um, just making yeah. sure. Definitely on the floor front row. Um, Buffett more or less said he was worried about taxes going up. And uh, that was part of the, the impetus for selling the position. They sold about 13% of their Apple shares. Um, the stock was up a lot last year. And that was pretty much what he said. He said, we think tax rates might go up. From here, we have big unrealized gains and realized gains. Uh, so, so it seemed like that was the push for it. How do we look at why, like, how do we look at Berkshire Hathaway selling out of a position? Because typically, you'd sell out of a position for one of two reasons. One, you think you can use that cash better elsewhere. Or two, you think that investment is not going in the direction you want it to go in. Mm -hmm. Obviously, he has no use for the cash to use it elsewhere. So the only other way to read into this is he doesn't think the investment is going where he wants it to go. Is that a fair assessment? It's possible. I mean, he had also said he expects uh, Apple to be their largest holding in a year from now. And when Greg takes over, expects it to be a, a large holding for them. So, I mean, I think the taxes, the tax implication was it. I don't know. I mean, uh, the valuation of the stock is probably plays a role in it. You know, mm. just taking some off the table. You're definitely right with it's not like they needed you know, $15 billion more on, on the 189. But, um, you know, besides besides the taxes, that's really all I had to point to. Does, does Berkshire buy back stock? They do. Um, they only started doing it a couple of years ago. They bought back $2.6 of stock this quarter. Buffett talks about a lot. They just can't buy back a lot because of the, the float. There's just not a lot for them to buy back. Ah. So they would buy back more, I think. But it's been about you know, two, three billion, one, two, three, and I don't see it going up from there. How was Omaha in May? It's fine. The weather was fine. It was, it rained a little bit. You have to line up at like five o'clock in the morning to get in there. So uh, that was tough, but it was, it's a spectacle. You should, you should go on yeah. there. I mean, the, the, the day before. Do you have to get the, tickets to get in? So you have to be a shareholder. Okay. Um, they give me a, 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 an analyst, an analyst thing, okay. but they don't really, you know, that's, you still wait online. Right. Um, and all, the day before, on Friday, all of the companies are in the, uh, the the arena. Yep. And you can go, you buy stuff, you can talk to some of the managements. Um, it's really great. And it's, it, like I said, it was packed. Wow. Everything was packed. Seize candy, they said they sold four tons of seize candy. <laughs> I was just going to end with <laughs> yeah. you. Did you eat any of the uh, peanut brittle? I, I did. I don't like peanut brittle, but um, <laughs> Seas Candy, by the way, not cheap Seas Candy. No, it's, it's pre, not. It's premium like 26 product. bucks yeah. a box. And really? I wow. mean, they yeah. were just hand over fist. And they got it down to a science where you step in the line, they give you the candy, you walk on the thing. <laughs> the other thing was Squishmallows, which I've talked about yeah. before. <laughs> My kids love these things. They bought, when they bought Allegheny, Allegheny owned this company called Jazzwares, which makes toys. Yep. And these things are just, you again, they can't sell them fast enough. All right, good stuff. Matt, Pat Palazzola, senior analyst who covers the insurance business ostensibly. He might be our, our candy analyst. Uh, he was out there in <laughs> Omaha. He does it all for Bloomberg Intelligence. Uh, we appreciate that. You're listening to the Bloomberg Intelligence Podcast. Catch us live weekdays at 10 a.m. Eastern on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business app. You can also listen live on Amazon Alexa from our flagship New York station. Just say, Alexa, play Bloomberg 1130. Seeing stocks up for what could be 
a third week in a row. We'll have to wait till Friday to see about that. Let's see what Brian Croes has to say about all this. President of Sharf Investments. He's joining us from beautiful Los Gatos, California. Brian, good to have you with us this afternoon. I'm going through uh, your thesis here. And you argue that there is too much optimism when it comes to tech out there right now. What's going on here? Because you say that uh, S&P 500 levels of concentration of tech go all the way back to a concerning time, the internet bubble. Yeah, thanks for having me. The, 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 as you know, tech has been a, a very strong performer um, really for since the, the 2022 bottom. And uh, you know, last year, for example, tech was up 56% despite the tech sector really having pretty mediocre earnings growth in total. Um, and so if you look at the, the tech sector relative to the S&P, it's actually at highs uh, above where that was in, in 1999. And, and as a percentage, the S&P 500 tech sector is 30% of the S&P, which is, which is higher than it was at the peak of the bubble. But that doesn't even include Amazon, Google, Tesla, or Meta. If you add those in, it's now 41%. To put it in perspective, you know, 10 years ago, the, the tech sector uh, was about 17% of the S&P. So really, tech is a huge weighting now in the S&P. Did they not earn? their way into that type of weighting here? I mean, you look at it in, in NVIDIA, for example, the bulls will tell you, boy, the multiple today is cheaper than it was before the run-up because we've seen such a surge in earnings. I guess that's just a way of saying, you know, is AI really a thing here? I mean, certainly uh, the tech sector has earned uh, some of its stripes by having better earnings growth over the last 10 years than the other sectors. Um, but, you know, we'd point to, to 1999 uh, and, and in 99, there was a lot of great companies, uh, Cisco, Intel, Dell, Sun Micro, Qualcomm, AOL. These are all companies that would have been in the top 10. And if an investor had bought those, those companies, despite what we all know was the tremendous growth of the internet, uh, you, know, you would have underperformed dramatically over yep. the next 20 years as an investor. So yeah, NVIDIA's growth is great right now. Tremendous company, tremendous CEO, but there's always competition to knock you off at the top and, and usually uh, those largest companies underperform over the longer term. So would you argue that there is actual competition coming for NVIDIA right now? Because it does seem like they have something, at least at the moment, that nobody else can offer. Oh, uh, there's 100% competition coming. I mean, we're based here in Silicon Valley. Uh, you know, the, the, the talk around the water cooler and, and barbecues is, <laughs> is 100%. I know people that are that are working at, at uh, Microsoft and Google, and they're all working to to find a, a cheaper chip. I mean, the one thing uh, tech companies don't like to do is be beholden to other tech companies if they can avoid it. Uh, now, that's not to say they're going to come up with something in the next year or two or even three, uh, but eventually, um, you know, there's going to be competition, uh, and uh, you know, competition is, is very fierce in tech. Hey, Brian, if if tech is not going to lead this market. What will, because there's a generation of investors out there that know nothing but tech leading this market higher. <laughs> yeah, it's kind, kind of amazing. Uh, you know, it's not just tech, it's growth in general. Yep. Uh, you know, we, look at, we looked at interest rates, um, and, and if you look, when rates are below 3%, uh, you know, growth outperforms. When rates are above 4%, uh, value outperforms. And actually, if you look back to 1960, the average of the 10-year treasury has been about 6%. Uh, and today it's you know around four and a half. All of the instances below three though have occurred since the, the GFC. And, and so a lot of younger investors only know a time when, when tech and, and growth outperform. Uh, however, if we're in a higher for longer environment, you know, we think it's a good, good environment for value. Uh, and if you look at growth versus value right now, there's, it's about a 90% premium, uh, which is well above you know, what you usually pay. Uh, so we think it's a uh, potentially a good time for for value stocks. What are some of those value stocks that uh, you guys are going after right now? Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, an example of a, a value stock that's kind of really beaten up, people don't like right now is Comcast. Uh, oh. it, it trades at around ten times earnings. Obviously, there's there's some worries around not only cable sub subscriber uh, disconnects, but also uh, the broadband has been weak coming out of the pandemic. That a very strong pandemic, but but broadband growth has gone in reverse recently because of uh, uh, you know, fixed wireless competition. But we think that uh, longer term, this is a you know, really great asset. Uh, if actually, interesting enough, over the last 10 years, Comcast has grown earnings at the same rate as Apple. 
uh, and yet uh, obviously trades at a, at a huge discount. So, you know, we think this is one of those names that, that investors are ignoring, but that should be a pretty high quality, good company over the next uh, 10 years. And a great management team, uh, I can tell you over from experience. Talk to us about dividends here, Brian. How important are dividends to you in a market where 10 year treasury is four and a half percent? Yeah, I mean, dividends are are one of the unsung heroes of investing. I mean, if you look over the long term, uh, dividends are a significant contributor to uh, to investors' returns. It's not something we absolutely look at. In other words, we're not saying, oh, we only want to buy a company with X Y Z dividend, but it, it fits into capital allocation strategy, uh, and capital allocation is uh, you know the holy grail for investors. Uh, companies that do bad capital allocation can really ruin you know, the, the future returns for investors, you know, uh, Berkshire Hathaway just had its annual meeting. Uh, and, you know, one of the things that's made them one of the best performing stocks uh, over the last, you know, 50 years is, is that Warren Buffett's been a tremendous steward of capital, even though they don't necessarily pay out large dividends. Uh, you can trust that the management's going to do the right thing uh, with the capital. Well, that's that's interesting. We were just having a conversation with our insurance analyst here earlier, $189 billion in cash, by and large, that doesn't sound like being a good steward of capital, um, although the interest rates today make it seem a little bit better, but shouldn't they be returning that to shareholders? So I think that a couple things from the Berkshire meeting takeaway is, remember, first of all, remember they, they're an insurance company, so this is uh, they have a lot of float. Uh, and so they have always chosen to be conservative, uh, although this is, this is sounding like it's going to be even more conservative. They had, they had mentioned the 189 billion in cash going to potentially 200 billion. So you bring a yeah. good point. Shouldn't they just be returning some of that? Well, first of all, some of that is float. Second of all, they're earning five percent plus on that capital right now. So what Buffett's really saying is, hey, I'm not seeing a lot of great opportunities. Better than that five percent I can get. It's risk free. I don't have to take the risks. And he also talked about uh, the ability to really step in in a crisis. And so. There's not only the 5% he's returning, but there's also the option value. And uh, no one's better than Berkshire Hathaway in terms of when events happen, uh, getting really good deals. So, so we look at it as you're getting 5% today with no risk, and you've got the optionality if something were to happen that they could really take advantage of that for shareholders. So $189 billion, that's a, that's a pretty big <laughs> pile is. of cash. Hey, um, I know we, uh, you talked a little bit about tech, but there is one tech company out there that you are bullish on. Um, you, you argue that Oracle is a sneaky AI play. Why are you bullish on Oracle? Yeah, I mean, Oracle is not cheap anymore. Uh, you know, it's still around an S&P multiple. Um, but the thing that makes it interesting is uh, they have really done a lot uh, behind the scenes in the cloud. And so people don't really think of them as a cloud player, but now they're with the purchase of Cerner, they're getting really big in, in healthcare. Uh, you've finally seen their cloud revenue really growing. I think the last quarter it was up uh, 26% or so. And the cloud is starting to become a, a large percentage of their total total earnings. Um, you know, Management on the last call was, was really giddy in terms of how much money they were able to spend and, and basically said, uh, they just didn't have enough capacity for all the demand. So we think it's it's sort of an under the radar uh, cloud play that has a lot more room to catch up uh, relative to some of the other big players. All right, Brian, thanks so much for joining us today. I really appreciate it. Brian Crowes, he is the president of Sharf Investments, joining us from Los Gatos, uh, California. You're listening to the Bloomberg Intelligence Podcast. Catch us live weekdays at 10 a.m. Eastern on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business app. Listen on demand wherever you get your podcasts or watch us live on YouTube. Let's talk litigation risk, regulatory risk for big tech. It's always been out there, but we're going to get some high-profile cases coming very soon. That's going to be really important for uh, a lot of companies, including Google. Jennifer Reed joins us. She's our senior litigation analyst at Bloomberg Intelligence. She joins us here in our Bloomberg Interactive Broker Studio. So, uh, Google, mm -hmm. antitrust trial about to begin. Can you give us the, the background of what's happening here with Google? 
Well, the one that's about to begin is an ad tech suit, but the one that just okay. finished up is the search suit. Very so, good. Okay. So I think it, it is. Kind of, to be fair, yeah. it is kind of hard to keep all these <laughs> lawsuits straight. It's so straight. hard that's to keep we have it all Jen straight, Reed. right? That's why we have Jennifer. <laughs> and, and we have many others too, right? The DIA, Google has other suits beyond that. But the thing is, I think what the ruling, the first ruling that's going to come out will probably be this search suit, right? Because they had the closing arguments. The trial actually ended about six months ago. The judge put a lot of space in between, I think, to really understand the facts and get, get go through all the evidence. Um, and I think he'll be deciding in, in a few months. And it's a really big deal because Google pays over $20 billion a year to other companies to set Google as the default search engine. Uh, they pay Apple, they pay Mozilla, they pay the OEMs that make the Android phones. And it may be that if the judge decides those agreements are exclusionary and that they're anti-competitive, that they arise to the level of exclusionary anti-competitive conduct, he says, you, you can't have these. You can't enter these agreements anymore. And the ones that are hurt are really not Google, because we all know Google search. You know, we're all going to keep using Google search. Yeah, it's a verb. We yes, yep. exactly. <laughs> it's the Kleenex. People of, aren't yep. jumping to search. switch over to Bing. At least exactly. not yet. Matt Miller. Maybe they will with does, chat. Is he, with, does he Bing? <laughs> yeah, because he he's a big chat. GPT guy. Oh, yeah, and the Microsoft. He's always cutting right. edge. And that okay. could change things. You know, the <laughs> yeah. market could change. So, you know, that's kind of out there, too, although this judge is looking backward in time, not really looking forward. They're looking at the conduct that has occurred in the last 10 years. But in the greater scheme of things, is that a huge threat to Google? Because if it is indeed the default search engine, mm -hmm. just because so many people are spent, you know, decades using it on their devices, on their computers, then if, you know, when you buy a new phone, Apple says, okay, which search engine would you like to be the default one? Will people just choose Google anyway? Well, I think that's the case, which is why the remedy is going to be really important here. This judge is going to have to get creative. And, you know, one of the things that he might do, if, in fact, he rules that, that Google's broken the law, I mean, that hasn't been determined yet. I tend to think he will, but it's very close. What he could say is, look, you've collected, there's this flywheel, and you've collected so much data through scale, through so many searches, that's allowed Google Search to get better. And Bing and DuckDuckGo and other potential nascent competitors out there can't get to that scale to teach the search engine to get better. So maybe what you have to do, Google, is share all that data and let others have a chance to actually become better and show what they can prove maybe let a nascent competitor come into the market, something like that. And in that way, there could be a threat, right? I mean, it's not unrealistic to think with all that data that Google's amassed over the years that some other company could come in and compete. So has Apple actually come in and maybe communicated to the judge somehow, like, whoa, 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 whoa. If you, <laughs> if you do what you, you could do, that's really gonna hurt us, unintended consequence maybe. Has Apple opined on this at all? So, so both Apple and Mozilla executives testified. And Apple actually, believe it or not, when they signed this agreement to get paid to set Google as the default, also agreed that they would defend it. If it ever right. came under attack, no, that's not a little bit suspicious right. or defensive. I don't know what is. But they, so they did come in and they defended the deal. Um, they said, look, it makes the Apple phone better. A user opens the phone, they go to Safari, and they do their search, and they have the best search engine. And that's better for our users. And Google's the best. And that's just the bottom line. Mozilla actually said, look, this is really going to hurt our business. We depend on the money that we get from Google. We're small. You know, Firefox is really small, and we need that money. So they did testify like that. Okay, like you said, this is not the only legal challenge that's facing right. the company. Why do the lawyers always get paid, by the way, Paul? Like, <laughs> yeah, it doesn't matter what, it doesn't always. matter what the rule is. By the is. hour. And right? a lot, yeah. and a lot. Yes. I, mean. yeah. I don't know, Jed, if you cover, <laughs> if you cover that. Um, but, but I am curious where this falls in sort of the scheme of, of lawsuits that uh, Google, for its part, is facing right now. Not to mention, I mean, uh, the lawsuits facing Amazon, FTC issues facing Apple. Amazon, Apple as well. Meta, you have FTC yeah. being Meta, right. All of them right now are facing big monopolization suits. Um, they have a suit coming up that challenges their ad tech business. It's, it's not a really business that consumers generally know about because this is a business to business mm -hmm. um, supply chain, right? That they kind of control. And it's about actually advertisers, digital advertisers and publishers, the software that they use to come together to place ads, right? To find the space, to up buy the space, to get the right to the right consumer and Google basically owns the entire supply chain they have dominance in many pieces of it and it's about manipulating that to take extract as much money from publishers and advertisers as they can that's the allegation that trial's coming up at the toward the end of this year and I think that's actually kind of a bigger deal right because it's in front of a jury now that doesn't happen very often because the DOJ can only go in front of a jury when they're looking for a monetary um, remedy they're looking for injunctive and monetary remedy because they themselves were advertisers. So they're saying, US was hurt 
by what Google did. We were advertisers and we paid more um, to do that advertising because of Google's conduct. But when it goes in front of a jury, mm -hmm. I think it's really hard for a jury to kind of parse out all the stages that have to be proven to prove an antitrust violation. This judge who is studying really hard in the Google search case is struggling. You can tell. This is hard for him. So determine that line between conduct that's anti-competitive and conduct that's just hyper-competitive is very difficult. And I think with a jury, there's probably a tendency for the DOJ just to paint the company as a big dominant bully rather than kind of getting into those nuances, and a jury's probably going to go that direction. That's what I think. So I think those are scary cases. All right, give us the timing on when some of these things are going to happen here, because I'm looking at the stock. Yeah. Stock's up 20% this year. It's up 60% mm -hmm. on the, over the tra trailing 12 months. The market's not worried about it. Not worried. What, what's the timing here of some of these? I think on liability, a decision will probably come out on the search case in a few months. And then a if that happens, okay. in a few months, that's what I think. And if that happens, he's gonna, the judge is going to have a separate hearing on remedy, a separate process to determine the proper remedy. I think he'll give them a few months to get prepared for that. Experts will be testifying in that. So I'm thinking maybe a remedy comes out sometime in fourth quarter. That's what I think. Okay, we only have a minute and a half left, but do you want to talk Apple? Meta. Or <laughs> yeah. What else is on your docket? Okay, Meta. Let's say the least risk is Meta. I, I think least risk. Least risk. Okay. I think the FTC will lose. Okay. Uh, all they're really seeking is a divestiture of Instagram or WhatsApp, and I just don't think it's hey, that's, that's not going to happen. That would be a big deal. It would be a big deal. It's. I don't think it's going to happen. Okay. I don't. I actually don't think the DOJ suit against Apple's all that great either. I know people would disagree with me, mm -hmm. but I think the allegations. Uh, I, I think Apple's changed some of the conduct that they're challenging already, and I'm, I. I think there are a lot of pro-competitive justifications which can outweigh some of those anti-competitive, allegedly anti-competitive conduct. Uh, Lena Khan versus Amazon. <laughs> I also don't think that's a great suit. I, wow. I, I think the best suits. That, I think the the suits against Google. I think have some teeth, have some possibility. I don't really think the other three suits are all that great. Okay. Interesting. Well, this is the, their time to get big tech, right? I mean, you know, never know what the next uh, administration is going to be. That's right, you don't know, although there are some uh, GOPers in the Congress that like what Lena Khan's doing. Yeah, really. And actually said yeah. if Donald Trump like keep her around. Yeah, I feel like yep. Republicans and Democrats, like they don't agree on anything except for going after big tech. Yeah, for different reasons. Yes, a for lot different of them, reasons. But they do yes. agree, yes. But if you ask the consumers, we're like, we like it. It's all good. Search works. The yeah, mm -hmm. I don't know. I mean, nobody's... I mean, it's the Amazon case in particular. I think. Yeah, Amazon. You know, they, works. they brought a lot of pro-competitive benefits to consumers in the market since they started, right? Yep. And so I think again, with these monopolization suits, it's always the anti-competitive harm weighed against yep. the pro-competitive side. And when you've got a strong pro-competitive side. Yep. All right, yeah. Jennifer Reed, thanks so much for joining us. Jen Reed, she is a senior litigation analyst for Bloomberg Intelligence, joining us live here in our Bloomberg Intelligence office. She doesn't mail it in like BI management does. She comes into the <laughs> office, which we appreciate in New York City as well. You're listening to the Bloomberg Intelligence Podcast. Catch us live weekdays at 10 a.m. Eastern on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business app. You can also listen live on Amazon Alexa from our flagship New York station. Just say, Alexa, play Bloomberg 1130. Tyson Food reported some numbers here. Uh, let's break it down with Jen Bartashis. She covers all of the retail stuff, all of the food companies for Bloomberg Intelligence. She's based down in Princeton, New Jersey. And I think she's using that Zoom stuff that the kids use these days to kind of, <laughs> you know, phone into us. Um, Jen, talk to us about Tyson Food here. What did you see from, again, what I just learned was the largest meat producer in the U.S.? Yeah, good morning. Um, so Tyson is one of the biggest meat producers globally, actually. Um, okay. And by all accounts, they had a pretty decent quarter. Um, they did raise their full year outlook for adjusted operating income um, off of strength in the chicken segment, which has been long awaited. Um, but the stock is trading down, likely on commentary, that they may see third quarter be weaker than fourth quarter, which would buck historical trends. And so uh, a little bit of a mixed report coming out of Tyson today, but generally a pretty solid quarter. Is the current quarter usually strong because we're getting into summer, we got Memorial Day coming up, we buy the meat for the barbecue. I mean, what, why is it typically stronger? So it's seasonally stronger for meats like um, your like your chicken or your and, and historically for beef, um, specifically because of grilling season. But it, that does translate into a weakness for prepared foods and for um, the pork segment generally. And so they're saying that the weakness in prepared foods and pork may outweigh the strength coming for the grilling season for chicken and for um, and for beef. All right, I'm looking at the PGEO function for. Uh, Tyson Food, TSN is, is the ticker. 
percentage of revenue, 37% beef, 33% chicken, 19% prepared foods, and 9% pork. Which business do you like? Which business does the street like? Is one better than the other? Better margins? Better growth? How do we think about that? So historically speaking, prepared foods is a much higher margin uh, business within the company, and there were intents from Tyson to grow that considerably. Um, that has great long-term potential, um, but they are going through a little bit of short-term turbulence with regards to um, additional startup costs associated with new plant lines and things like that. The chicken segment, which is a big part of the company's business, has been underperforming for years. Um, and so what's encouraging coming out of today's earnings is that the chicken segment is finally showing improvement. Uh, margins are up. Um, they're they're doing better with efficiencies. And even though overall volume is down, it's a much healthier um, margin that they're achieving out of that chicken business. Um, now, remember, they've closed a bunch of plants recently. They've been resizing their, their processing footprint. So um, all the things that they need to do seem to be underway to help make that a much more profitable and bigger contributor to the overall company. It was interesting to hear Nora. Uh, and and actually, the, I would say we, we had, I don't know if you Jen heard this, but we had kind of an interesting conversation about Tyson Foods just moments before we came to you because Nora chose it as one of her market movers. And we all were all talking, well, we don't necessarily know necessarily the um, brand of whatever we're buying when we're in the store. And Tyson has much more than just Tyson Foods. Is this at its core 100 percent a commodity company or do the brands, Sara Lee, Ballpark, Hillshire Farm, Jimmy Dean, Tyson, Bosco's, Gallo salami, do these matter to consumers? The brands do matter. Um, and it depends on which uh, consumer demographic you're talking about. But Tyson has intentionally over the past several years moved away from being a strictly commodity driven company. Um, that has helped smooth out earnings volatility. That helps make it a much healthier margin profile overall. Um, and so that progress, I think, is going to continue. So those brands are in very central to that uh, long term that long-term plan. Um, that said, you're right. There is a lot of uh, Tyson meat out there that you eat and you don't even realize it's Tyson. They, you know, obviously will supply retailers that then have that as their private label brand. There are things like that that happen. Um, but overall, um, what we're seeing is with the consumer, um, especially lower income uh, households, um, have been trading more into private label. And mm. that has left these brands a little bit uh, lower in terms of overall volume that they're being that's that's being sold. So so that's where we're seeing a little bit of that, a little bit of that brand volatility in the last few quarters. So for a company like Tyson and Jen, when you talk to investors in this company, what's the call here? I mean, are they did they own it for the dividend? Did they own it because they're bullish on chicken? I mean, what's the investment call for owning a, a food company like this? Well, the dividend has been uh, something that's uh, been of, of appeal in recent years. Um, the good news is that Tyson is back to where their free cash flow generation will cover the dividend. Um, so that's that that also appeases some concern that the dividend might be cut. Um, so generally, it's been it, it's been along those lines. Um, there is also long term growth. Um, you know, Tyson has been slowly expanding international operations um, when they get the formula right, uh, meaning they get the right productivity in the plants that they've opened up overseas. There is a long runway for potential growth um, for Tyson outside the United States, as well as with in the United States. So that's a little bit of the appeal as well if you're a longer term uh, perspective um, investor. Uh, anything that investors have to keep their eyes on when it comes to supply issues out there, any bird flu, avian flu type stuff that's getting into uh, their production line that we've seen hit other types of companies? Yeah, so so uh, the, the bird flu or avian flu is certainly something that's in the headlines lately. Um, it's been impacting, It's you know, we've seen outbreaks in very specific areas thus far, hasn't really had a major impact on Tyson this year, um, but we are watching that very carefully. Um, the One of the longer term issues uh, Tyson's gonna face is just the beef cattle cycle. Um, we're at the bottom of a cycle. Um, there's very limited um, animal availability. Um, and once that, that herd starts to rebuild, things are gonna get a little bit worse before they get better with regards to supply. Um, that means that the profitability of the cattle, of the beef segment within Tyson is going to remain pressured well into 2025. Wait a minute. Are we, are there not enough cows out there? Well, no, no there, there are, <laughs> there, we just there keep are slaughtering cows. them for food. That's the problem. <laughs> exactly. 
<laughs> exactly. Uh, we're at the bottom of the cycle, which means that the, the, the supply is just very limited. Um, and because, you know, cows take 18 months, two years to, to reach slaughter size, um, it's a slow rebuild. And right now we're not seeing the initial signs of, of herd rebuilding that we need to really to, to really right, become. You're a research analyst. Yeah, now, better, Jen, better how, do you, how do you decide as an analyst how the herds are? Like you go out and count cows out in Montana? Well, no, I, I look at USDA data. Oh, okay. um, yeah, so that's that's you know USDA expectations, um, but you also talk to people who are who are in the industry, right? Um, and there are things that affect you know when those those herds are going to be rebuilt, um, the price of hay, um, the the drought conditions, um, interest rates. You know, all of these things impact ranchers and their ability to take on the cost of rebuilding herds. Um, and so you know, once those things start to optimize a little bit, then you'll start to see herds grow. Then you'll start to see um, a much higher um, uh, intent in terms of uh, supply that'll be coming to market in the next couple of years. What's the um, and this kind of goes back to Paul's question, but I thought chicken was like the hottest thing out there right now um, in terms of what consumers want. We saw Chipotle, Chick Fil A running low. Chick Fil A is huge. Raising Cane's <laughs> is absolutely mm -hmm. huge right now. Why is chicken only gone in 2019 from 32.2 percent of revenue to 33.7 percent of revenue? That was 2019 to 2023. Well, a lot of that has been price depreciation. So there's been um, oversupply in the market. Um, when that happens, prices are down. Um, that's great for consumers. It's great for restaurant chains in terms of buying, um, but it's not great for the producers. Um, and so, you know, um, part of what we're looking for is, you know, that prices start to stabilize a little bit, um, which will lead to, you know, opportunity for um, revenue growth to, to, to renew in the chicken segment. I'm sorry, Paul, did you just say price depreciation? I thought everything was getting more expensive. <laughs> yeah, the commodities. I yeah. mean, I guess, so what, I'm, what I learned here, Jen, is uh, chickens are short cycle, cows are long cycle. Correct. All right, boom, <laughs> see, you learned something. All right, All right Jen Martash is farm. great stuff, senior retail analyst for Bloomberg Intelligence. I do remember from my days living down in Virginia, North Carolina, you know, you're out on the interstate and flatbed after flatbed after flatbed of these trucks would have chicken crates strapped on there and feathers are coming out all over the place so you can't drive behind them I didn't and, and it's not a good day for the chicken because i don't think <laughs> where the chicken's going is not a good place for the yeah chicken. that's not a that's but not that's a, where i think you get a lot of chickens is from north carolina it's not a truck you want to be on necessarily i yeah. thought you were going to go somewhere else with the whole like you know out in colorado you know you got family out in yep. colorado like you go north of boulder to, to fort collins Greeley area huge cattle area right and Uncle you Pierre. can you can smell it. Yeah, you can smell it when you're <laughs> exactly. there. Exactly. So Same with the uh, central part of California. Yep. Yep. Very good. So anyway, we learned what we needed to learn about chickens and cows and pork uh, pork bellies. Um, you know, <laughs> always have to look at the pork belly. <laughs> um, all right, that was Jen Bartash is talking about Tyson's food. You're listening to the Bloomberg Intelligence Podcast. Catch us live weekdays at 10 a.m. Eastern on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business app. You can also listen live on Amazon Alexa from our flagship New York station. Just say, Alexa, play Bloomberg 1130. Tim Stenevich sitting in for Alex Steele here this morning. I'm Paul Sweeney. We're live here in our Bloomberg Interactive Broker Studio. This is the Bloomberg Intelligence Show. We also stream this thing live on uh, the interweb. That would be uh, YouTube.com search Bloomer Podcast, and that's where you'll find us. You know, Tim, a lot of folks were saying, you know, coming off of that October base level, had that big 25% plus move up in the S&P 500. A lot of folks were saying, boy, we could use a nice pullback. That would be healthy, 5%, 10%. Did we get it, Paul? I don't know. We kind of had don't that think we did. from the end of March through, you know, kind of mid-April. We kind of had that 4 or 5% pull down, but here we are moving higher. Was that it? <laughs> it was, I don't know, man. Yeah, I mean, with these uh, with these pullbacks, it's kind of like blink and you'll miss it, blink right? Blink and you miss it. Christina Hooper joins us, Chief Global Market Strategist for Invesco. She looks at the big picture for a huge pool of money. Christina, what do you make of that little pullback we had in the S&P 500? What did you make of that? And did we just march higher from here? Well, I think that pullback and the quick ending of that pullback reflects just the changing views on the path of monetary policy this year. When markets got pessimistic and they felt that a cut was far away and that potentially a hike could come sooner, um, we saw a sell-off. But the problem with the sell-off was that there's an awful amount of cash sitting on sidelines. 
and many investors are overweight cash. And so the reality is that with fundamentals looking fairly good, earning season going well, it's hard to sit on the sidelines if you see something of a bargain, even if it's not a, a Kmart level blue light special. <laughs> and so as a result, this was not necessarily the sell off that mm. many wanted to see. But I think it's a function of the environment we're in. Where is that cash on the sidelines, Christina? Is it in is it in high yield savings accounts that are still giving us 5%? Is it in money market funds? Where is it? Interestingly, it's in a combination of places. Uh, and and so certainly some are enjoying higher yields, but not all, um, relatively speaking. Um, but the key is that I think this money was never intended for long term um, cash savings. It always was sitting, waiting or, or at least uh, had a good chance of going back into the stock market once investors felt more comfortable. And I think we've gotten to that point, especially with last week, where the narrative has changed somewhat. And I think we'll see more cash moving into equities as investors get more comfortable um, with this changing narrative. Christina, I, I know at Invesco, you guys really take a global view, broadly defined, you know, given where the various central banks are in, in terms of their posture about cutting rates, it seems like the ECB and the Bank of England may, may be even a little ahead of the Fed here. How do you think about the U.S. versus non-U.S.? Well, the U.S. has clearly been more resilient. Uh, it has been um, not as significantly impacted by aggressive rate hikes. And so as a result, we are at a place where the Bank of England and in particular the ECB look poised to move sooner. And I think that's going to be the case. It's just a a function of the greater resilience of the U.S. economy, which in turn has to do with, in my opinion, two key reasons. First, the U.S. gave its households more fiscal stimulus. Certainly there was fiscal stimulus flowing in Europe and the U.K., um, but it was more significant in the U.S. In addition, we had this wonderful um, uh, phenomenon called long-term fixed rate mortgages that not a lot of other countries can participate in, uh, that can enjoy. And as a result, um, one key um, part of household finances, one's mortgage payment, wasn't impacted by the very aggressive rate hike cycle we experienced. We can't say that, for example, for our Canadian neighbors and, and for European neighbors. They experienced uh, changes or increases in mortgage payments for the most part. Christina, we spoke earlier to Brian Crow as over at Sharf Investments, and he said that investors here in the U.S. are too optimistic when it comes to tech. Do you agree with that? Well, I think you have to ask the question, what time frame are you talking about? Um, because we've seen this before where investors can get very excited. And if they have a shorter time horizon, they can easily be disappointed. Um, but for those investors that have a long time horizon and are employing some kind of selectivity in their investments, um, can, you know, could very well benefit. Uh, a lot of it, though, is having that patience, having that longer time horizon because we could see periods where tech stocks become very highly valued. We could see periods of disappointment in terms of earnings, but certainly there's a lot of innovation going on in, in tech. It reminds me very much of the late 1990s and the excitement over the internet. Um, investors threw their money at internet stocks. Uh, some worked, some didn't. And it was about um, essentially ferreting out uh, the areas of opportunity and sticking with them, um, even though there were some, some certainly periods of disappointment in there. Um, Christina, our listeners, our viewers, they've been hearing this term a lot recently, stagflation. What does stagflation mean to you? And is it a concern for investors? Well, I think that Jay Powell closed the book on that last week. <laughs> um, uh, although I, I will say that that we did see a lot of uh, internet searches on, on the term stagflation before. To me, it's an environment like the 1970s, right, where growth is really disappointing. It's stagnant. Um, but uh, inflation is high and it's very sticky. 
And while we've certainly seen some kind of aspects uh, of uh, some components of inflation that have been stickier, um, this disinflation journey has been very imperfect. I don't think this is an environment where we have high sticky inflation. I think we're going to see some nice progress in disinflation this year. And we can't say that growth is stagnant. Um, certainly there are some cracks appearing uh, in the U.S. economy, but that's what the Fed wanted. It wanted to cool a relatively hot economy um, that has had sub 4% unemployment for a very significant period of time. Christina, where do you think we'll see that disinflation? I mean, it's been pretty stubborn in many areas, and um, certainly the last mile has proven to be just as tough as many people thought it would. So we're starting to see a little easing uh, in wage growth. If the if April's jobs report uh, suggests a trend, I think it does. Uh, I think that will filter into, and, and also I think we are seeing uh, an increase in unemployment. I think that all filters into a moderation in services spending. I mean, we're already hearing in a number of earnings reports that the consumer has become even more selective in their purchases, is even more concerned about expenses and, and uh, the prices they pay for certain items. So I think that we'll continue to see progress in terms of disinflation on the services side. That has been, I think, unusually hot for a long period of time. Um, and over the course of the year, I, I think the situation will get significantly better. Hey, Christina, just looking at today's price action, we've got the S&P up a half of 1%, but the Russell's up about 1.2%. How do you think about some of the small mid-cap names here vis-a-vis, -vis, you know, the big tech names that have been such, you know, powerhouses for this market? Well, I think there's room for more participation. And I look specifically at smaller cap names as an area of real opportunity. Uh, if one believes, as I do, that we are going to see a stabilization, that this slowdown is going to be um, relatively brief, we're going to see a reacceleration in economic growth, and that's a reacceleration globally. Um, by the way, the OECD even updated its forecast last week for global growth. That's cr That creates a, a real opportunity for small caps, and I think that's why we're already seeing improved performance from smaller cap stocks. It's so interesting, Paul. I'm just looking at uh, the uh, top function here at Bloomberg, and uh, one of the stories that just came out is this uh, great story by our own Michael McKenzie and Liz Capo McCormick. At $2 million per minute, treasuries are minting cash like never before. Finally, for the first time in nearly a generation, fixed income is living up to its name. Christina, how much does that hold back? Equities. There, as I said, there's a lot of cash on sidelines. So there are a lot of places for that cash to go. And it's not a mutually exclusive situation. Uh, investors can put money into bonds and can put money into equities. And I suspect that's what we're going to see. So I think there's a growing recognition think, and appreciation for diversification. I just, I'm just curious, like if, if we do see rates come down, do we see that cash then move off the sidelines and into equities? Or is that the type of cash that wants to stay in something that's more predictable? I think the cash will, probably the majority of it will go into equities, but I suspect that it's also going to go into fixed income, um, just because there's a recognition that that fixed income is more attractive than it's been uh, in years and years, and that's going to continue. Um, and also, I think we're going to see more money going in, into alternatives. Again, diversification is so important, and I think investors are recognizing that more and more as they see the unpredictability of, of the larger environment. Christina Hooper, thank you so much for joining us. Always appreciate getting your thoughts. Christina Hooper, she's the Chief Global Market Strategist uh, at Invesco. This is the Bloomberg Intelligence Podcast, available on Apple, Spotify, and anywhere else you get your podcasts. Listen live each weekday, 10 a.m. to noon Eastern, on Bloomberg.com, the iHeartRadio app, Tune in and the Bloomberg Business app. You can also watch us live every weekday on YouTube and always on the Bloomberg Terminal.